Today on Ask This Old House. This house in Virginia was built in the 90s with a type of pipe that could burst and flood the house. I'll tell you what it is and how we fix it. I'll cover your trashes for drop cloths. And we'll share more home inspection nightmares. This is just a mess of wires. And the only thing I can say is that at least they used a junction box. You hear that? This door is really squeaky. I'll show you a few different ways to make it quieter. And I'll explain what indoor air quality is and how to improve it. And these pollutants are coming from everywhere. The cleaning products under our sink, paints, carpets, furniture. Are you Deb? I am. Hi, Richard. Welcome to Richmond. It's nice to be here. I don't think I've ever been in this city before. It's beautiful. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. How long have you been here? I built the house in 1991. And the reason I emailed you is because about a year ago in the winter, my pipes froze. And when the plumber came, he went under the house and came out and said, you have polybutylene pipes and I'm not going to touch them. And you had no idea you had PB. I didn't. And I got your email. I brought a sample of this. This was the this was the pipe that was the craze in the mid-70s. It was polybutylene, it was flexible, you could fish it anywhere, the connections were easy to make. But they found that over time the connections could fail and the pipe could actually fail. And so by 1995 it was outlawed. So what? You built this in 91. Yes. So, so you were right at the end of the era of polybutylene. And they used to do it in a couple of different places in the country. One was the Pacific Northwest and the other was? Right here, the Mid-Atlantics. So I'm sure a lot of your neighbors have this stuff too. Yes, they do. And once I learned what I have, I talked to several neighbors and they've had their pipes replaced as well because uh, they had some failures of the pipe inside the walls that they didn't know about. Right. And then some of them, they had leaks that they actually saw. I mean, that's the thing. These fittings can be up inside the wall and just drip, drip, drip insidiously. You wouldn't even notice it. So really the only way now is to get rid of it. So what we've done is we've actually found a local plumbing contractor who's gonna help us get that old pipe PB out of here. Excellent. Yet. Travis should be here, I hope. Yes, he is. Come on in. And this house is beautiful inside, too, Deb. I love it. Thank you, Richard. And there's our friend Travis. How are you, sir? Good. How are you, Richard? You got a little jump on us in here? I did. And you know, this thing couldn't be any easier to replumb. Good. We have an unfinished crawl space here, which allows us to access everything from underneath without doing minimal damage in here. Which is not the typical case. I've seen these jobs where you got a bathroom over here and a washing machine up here and you end up opening up walls and ceilings and it's really painful. So take us through how you're going to attack this thing. Okay, well we're going to start over here in our kitchen. Uh, we're going to access it through the bottom of the cabinet here. So hot, hot and cold. And cold. Good. Mm -hmm. We have our ice maker over here, which we'll access up through here. Okay, two down. Two down. Uh, like I said, most of our fixtures are on this floor. Great. We have our laundry room here, which we can access from our crawl space. Nice, nice, nice. And a first floor bathroom here. Okay, full bath here. Full so bath So that just here. comes up through the floors, great. But there's a bathroom above us. Yes, sir, there is. So you can see, oh, here's the PB right here, Deb. So yeah. it doesn't actually look too bad. It's some, the better connections of the two that they had. But so you'll be able to actually repipe this entire house with only open up just what we see right here. Yes, sir. That's pretty amazing. Let's get the water turned off. I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Richard, here's our crawl space door. Crawl space? We don't have a lot of those where I come from. Yes, sir. Everything here in Richmond is typically a crawl space. Okay. Well, I'll let you go in. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what do we got? Okay, what we have here is our polyethylene line that comes from the street. And that's good news because that's the type of plastic we don't have to change, so we don't have to dig up your front lawn. Great. Go Thank ahead. you. Our main shutoff, which then transitions to the PB. Right. All right, so you ready to shut that off right now? Yes, sir. All right, water's off. I see an outside faucet here. Why don't you throw that in the bed over there? Okay. Water's coming on. All right, so we're going to go open up the faucets inside, break the vacuum. Okay, right? Richard, we're going to begin tearing things out. All righty. All right, so here is the polybutylene we're taking out of the building. Flexible, seems terrific. And here's what we're putting back in. This is a PEX tubing, cross-linked polyethylene, P-E-X. Why would you take out one plastic pipe and replace it with another plastic pipe? You know, although they look similar, they are not the same. This is a tougher pipe, and it's been proven in the world market. Since the 70s, it's been used for radiant floor heating first. 
And for all those years, it's put into concrete slabs and it gets heated and it gets cooled and it really is in a tough environment and it lasts. And it's been safely used for 25 years in the United States for potable water. You know, when I mention metal to you, right, you, you know the difference between steel and tin. You know, steel is stronger. With plastics, we all lump them together and really there's a different chemistry inside of each one of these. So the best way to test them is to take them back to really the way, where they were when they were first manufactured, this amorphous state. So I've got a heat gun right here. And this is made up of oil-based resins, hydrogen and carbon, that when we heat them up, it start, it'll start to soften it. Okay, so now it's softened now. Now watch what happens when I pull it apart. It has very little sidewall resistance and it just pulls apart like taffy, okay? Now, so that's a simple plastic. This is the PEX, and what's happened is those molecules that used to be just long strings are now cross-linked, much like a chain-link fence. You see how it's turned clear? Now very clear. So now, unlike the simple plastic, if I give extraordinary pull, watch how much harder it is to pull this apart. It's as if I've cut it with a knife. All pipes are not created equal. Isn't that something? It really is. The pipe is only part of the story. Let me show you the fitting connection. Now you can watch This Old House and Ask This Old House anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Travis has run new pecs to replace the polybutylene from the crawl space to the bathroom on the second floor. And now he has to make some connections with fittings. For those, pec sleeves are installed on the outside of the tubing. This tool will expand the inside dimension of the tubing and the sleeve. The expanded tubing allows the fitting to stick inside, but only for a few seconds, because the tubing and the sleeve have a memory and will return to their original dimension, which makes a watertight connection. Well, this was a very good day. In another couple of hours, you're gonna get the water back on, right? Absolutely, and Deb, all you'll have is a few drywall repairs and a little bit of paint touch up. Oh, uh, I can take care of that, thank you. You know, this really was a great reminder for a lot of people. You know, many people like you have PB pipe in there. They don't even know it until it either leaks or they go to sell the house and the home inspector tells them so. But you're in good shape for the next 100 to 150 years, all right? Oh, thank you for coming to Richmond. It was my pleasure. He did all the good work. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Good job, catch you later. We see our fair share of crazy things from home inspectors all across the country. They send them to us, so we share them with you, and we have a little bit of fun along the way. Who's first? Oh, I'm not even guess. sure where to start with this. Eat this first. I mean, looks like dinner. At least they used a junction box, but it is. It's a big spaghetti mess of wires into this small container and wire nuts everywhere. There's no way you can close that up. How I, many are, are you allowed in a, in a bar? In something like that, maybe four or five, depending on the actual so size. Close. So they're yeah, only so over by four or five sizes. More, more is plenty. <laughs> they are oozing out. It's walking the line, yeah. Well, yeah. check mine yeah. out. Wow. Real estate oh. listed oh, nice. built-in nice. wow. irrigation system. Is that y'all work? No. <laughs> we have one, pipes two, everywhere. One, two, three, four, five, six off of one spigot. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty incredible. And what's the red tape for? Oh, to plug the leaks. Oh, nice. <laughs> Just a little handy tie. Uh, well, that's good, but talk about leaks. Look at this. Huh? There's a slate oh. roof. Oh. Slate roofs are difficult to patch, okay. but when you patch them, it's, it's really a method. You're supposed to put a piece of copper flashing down, put the slate in, bend it up. That stops it from dropping down. But this way, the du duct tape. Duct tape fixes everything. It's a everything. lot easier. Oh. I, you know, you don't have to buy the <laughs> copper. You don't have to take the time. I love the old world craftsmanship of slate and duct tape. Yeah. <laughs>
You know, duct tape, I use it for my sneakers to hold them together. But this guy, oh, use wow. it oh, to, wow. that makes that tub absolutely waterproof for at least 27 minutes. That's beautiful. Yeah. Is, that that no, is that wrong? Is that wrong? In a funny way, it isn't. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we I'm love sure. getting them and we love having fun with them. So if you've got a home inspection nightmare and a picture, send it to us. We'll have a blast with it. Taking a tub, Richard. You take a tub once a week. I do. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Okay, Mauro, a lot of drop cloths on the shelf at the home center. We got to pick the right one for the paint job. What do you think? Are we going with canvas straight up? Well, if you're going to canvas, this is what we don't use. Painters usually don't do this. They really? usually, for, I mean, we can use for prep work, but most of the time what we're using is this one here, Kevin. It's canvas backed. It has a plastic here. Mm -hmm. Even if we have like a paint accident, it won't go to the surface. So we like canvas because it can absorb spilled paint, but you like it backed so that the paint doesn't go all the way through and ruin the carpet or the floor. Just want to make sure that we have no accidents at all. All right, with so with no backing, just for the scraping and the prep. Absolutely. Well, what do you got here? Well, this one is also a canvas, but it has this product that sticks to the floor and is good for staircase and cabin. Oh yeah, like little rubber nubs, yep, huh? That won't slip. So yes. I go to the home center, I haven't seen that, but when I see these things, I'm thinking, man, that's expensive. And the plastic here, the, even the thick stuff, this is yeah. a lot cheaper. Exactly, but we use, we use only this for outside. We use it for cover uh, plants and shrubs, pack up at the end of the day, throw it away. You don't use this on the ground when you've got a ladder and you're working outside? Absolutely not. N why not? It's slippery. Uh, okay, slippery. So outside for the thick stuff? Yeah, that's four that mil. Mean, that's what, is what? That's four mil. Four there. mil? Yeah. And then so does that mean that the thin stuff you use inside? The thin stuff is the stuff that I like to use to cover furniture and cover uh, everything inside the room when it's furniture and. So this is for covering, again, not underfoot? Not underfoot, absolutely not. What about the big blue guy here? Okay, you guys big use blue these? guy is excellent to use on the exterior projects. When you're scraping a house, a heavy scraping, you tie up that on the wall and everything that falls into the stop, Put it in a trash bag, you can clean it, you can wash it, and it will be ready for many other projects. But don't use it when you're actually doing the painting on the exterior. On the this floor, absolutely not. The things I don't know. Yeah. Paper? Paper. Um, I like to use this paper. Once we paint a room with lots of baseboards, mm. I like to run a layer of paper all along the baseboards, oh. and then I leave like four or five inches off, and I still put my drop cloths on top of so it. So canvas on top of the paper, and you're using this because you want a nice tight line that you can cut nice, to? Nice, crisp line that's like, you know, make it cool, beautiful. Well, I now know what brush to pick, and uh, obviously now what drop know. cloth to use, now too. you know which drop cloth to use, yeah. interior and exterior. Thank you, Mara. You're welcome. Hey, Ross. Hey, Richard. Hey. What are you guys working on? Talking about indoor air quality today. Cool. You know, buildings need to breathe. And when I first got in this business, they breathed plenty. You know, they breathed at a rate of 10 to 12 air changes per hour. That, that, meant that needs like a full stop to make right. people understand that. Right. Like all of the air in the house yeah. leaves right. 10, 12 times yeah, an hour? Divide that into 60 minutes. Every five minutes, you have the whole house completely emptied out and replaced because everything leaks so much. That's a lot of breathing. Right. So nowadays, what are we seeing? I mean, nationally, the average is seven air changes and code in Massachusetts for new construction is three. And uh, that's because of spray foam and air barriers. You know, we're getting away from the traditional building materials we used to, we used to use. So how bad is the indoor air quality as a result? Inside this house, it's the ultimate sort of petri dish, this hamper, really, where stuff is trapped. And people don't realize that the air inside most houses is two to five times worse than any air you're going to find on a busy city street because it's trapped. That's depressing. Absolutely. Indoor air is dirtier Absolutely. than outdoor air. And these pollutants are coming from everywhere. The cleaning products under our sink, paints, carpets, furniture, I mean, cooking. People, right, me. You. I talk you. a lot. A lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> the gas range, the oven, right. right? Those are all giving off chemicals. So these gadgets that I'm looking at here, are they going to tell me what I've got in the air and how bad it is? So these are a variety of different monitors that have different sensors. Mm -hmm. So this one does CO2, right, where we're breathing out. It does temperature. It does relative humidity. Mm -hmm. This one, for example, is doing VOCs, particulate matter. Mm -hmm. Those are the particulates that are really, really small. You can't see that you can actually inhale, get into your lungs and into your bloodstream. So we don't have a device that tells us everything that's in the air and breaks right. it down. You need a device to go looking for right. a particular right. thing. You're you picking specific things. You've got to decide what you want to monitor and find okay. the right device for it. So once this thing tells me I have too much CO2 or what was it, VOCs? VOCs or particulate matter. What do I do with it? Well, you've got to ventilate. You know, a building needs to breathe, but it doesn't need to breathe through every door and window. It needs to have a set of lungs. And if I was talking about a set of lungs, it would be a box something like this, either called an HRV or an ERV. So how it works is that you've got this core in the middle and now stale air that would leave the building from bathrooms or contaminated air would pass this way with a fan across this core and to outside. But at the very same time, another fan brings exhaust outside air in across this core in the opposing direction. So imagine this here in the winter. It's rich with temperature and it goes wants to leave to outside. It would have just gone outside. Now the cold air picks up the heat that's in the exiting air and it keeps the energy inside the building. So you keep the energy inside the building, but exhaust the fresh air, yeah. exhaust the stale air out of the building. We've seen those before. I get it. I put one of these things on my wall, which I have not seen before. What does it do? Does it beep and say turn on or alarm or? So yeah, some of them will just give you a visual indicator, but like a light, right, that changes colors. Some of them will actually talk to your phone. So it'll actually send you a notification or it'll actually give you a graph that shows mm -hmm. you when you, actually, yeah. when you actually have bad air, uh, air quality. And so here's a main screen for one of them. I can see three different pollutants, particulate matter, VOCs, and carbon dioxide. I can also see temperature and relative humidity in the space. And here, I'm actually seeing them over time. So here's an event where our particulate matter actually spiked to 251. Caused by? And that was caused by the uh, gas range being on without the exhaust fan running. Oh, yeah. okay. At the most basic level, you could crack a window or run an exhaust fan when you see this, but where it's going is that these devices now are talking to these devices or other yeah. exhaust fans. Right. Like a smart thermostat. That's right. That's now right. we got smart So it does it automatically behind the scenes. So what do you guys think? New normal? Are we going to be seeing a lot of these? I think you have to. Everybody's going to watch it. The buildings are only getting tighter. And the last thing I'll say about this is I built a new house, what, 15 years ago, super tight with all the foam insulation, tight windows, and I didn't have one of these for the first year. And what happened is we always felt sluggish and mold formed everywhere. And then we put it in and it just changed. It's an intangible that you can't really mm. transfer until you live with it. Just to have fresh air in the building. It just changes the way you Absolutely. live in the space. Cool. So. All right, guys. Well, good information. Thank you. Thank you. So which one measures methane? <laughs> that one does. Yeah, so I really appreciate you coming by, Tom. My pleasure. The, uh, our house was built in the 1940s. We bought it about four years ago. Uh, my wife, my parents, and I, we completely gutted the entire place. Um, really? Brand new plumbing. Yeah, brand new plumbing, uh, electrical, wallboard, insulation. We did the kitchen ourselves, hung the cabinets, the counters. You did it all, oh. even the tile work? Even the tile work, yeah. It, it's been a process. It's a it's lot of work, A lot it? of work, but very rewarding. Yeah, I mean, look what you've done. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one thing that is driving me insane are these doors. Uh, my two-year-old son lives down the hall here. We sleep here, and our coats and to feed the cat in the morning. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning to go to work. Yeah. And when I go down the stairs, I have to open the door. Oh, I hear that. And that squeak at four o'clock in the morning is—it's like a—it's like an air raid siren. Yeah. So wakes your son up. Wakes him up. Yeah, wakes him up. No problem. Well, you know, there's a lot of. Well, that is loud. <laughs> there is a lot of reasons why a hinge can squeak, and one of them is alignment could be aligned, not misaligned from the door to the jam or hinge to hinge. And if I look right up at this top hinge right here, you can see that these barrel alignments aren't right on. Have you tried anything at all? Yeah, I've tried different types of lubricants, but to be honest, a week, couple weeks, a month later, the squeak just keeps coming back. Yeah. So what's happening is they could be wearing uh, back and forth, and when the lubricant wears out, it starts to squeak. Sure. So what I want to do is I want to take some of the stress off of one hinge at a time. And to do that, I'm going to knock the pin out. All right, so it's still squeaking. A little bit. You can also see how this hinge pin holds the hinges together. Right. When I pull that out, the door drop down. Sure. All right, so I'm going to knock this one in just a little bit. Okay. Put it back. All right, I just put that one in there loose. Okay. Now I'll go after the second one. Now 
that hinge pin came right out. Yeah. Not a lot of stress on that right. one. Pretty quiet though. Yeah, it quieted right down. Yeah. Let's put it back in and see if that, but I also don't have this one all the way right. down. Yeah, still pretty quiet. Yeah, so it, it could be this one right here. Mm -hmm. That hinge pin's not down all the way. So I don't even know if I have to do that bottom one. Let me see if I tap it back down, see if we get the squeak back. So I think it's that top hinge. And I think it has to do with the alignment of the barrels right here that okay. I showed you. Yeah. But let me show you on a hinge over here. Okay. Now you said you've tried some lubricant. Yeah. All right, so if I was dealing with a squeaky hinge like that, the first thing I would grab is some multi-purpose oil right here that you yeah. get at the hardware store okay. or the home center. And what you'd want to do is you want to pull the hinge pin up just a little bit and take a couple of drops and put it right on the side just like that okay. and let that flow down. Put a little drop there, a little drop here, a little drop here. All right, and then drive the pin back and move it back and forth. Yeah, I tried that. Uh, it lasted a couple weeks, but it, the squeak came back. All right, so you tried that. So the next thing I would do is I'd pull out the pin all together and take some of this lubricant right here. It's a dry graphite, and I just squeeze a little of the powder down the hole there. Okay. Maybe even shoot a little bit up from the bottom. Yep. Take the pin, put it in a little bit, lubricate the pin. and drive it down and push it back and forth to wear it in. Yeah, I tried that. It did work a lot better than the multi-purpose lubricant, but after a couple of weeks, it just didn't do the trick. Okay, well, I think it's an alignment problem right here, as I pointed out on the door. Okay. And also the gap spacing between each hinge. So okay. look right here, if I move this one, see how it's moving uh, yeah. up and down yep. from one another? That creates a gap for the hinge to flow easily without okay. any resistance. Sure. And I think by that barrel on your door there, because the barrel is out of alignment, it may be too tight on one side. Okay. So what I want to do first is try to see if we can align that while it's on the door. All right, sounds great. So let me show you this hinge right up here. Okay. If you look at this bottom one, it's bent in like that. Yeah. Okay, so again, we have the gap on this side, but mm -hmm. not on that side. And you go up higher, we've got a gap here, but not here. Sure. And this top one actually looks like it's bent that yeah, way. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to remove this pin and see if I can knock it back in place. Okay. Okay, so now the pin's out. So I'm going to take the pin and I'm going to try to use that to bang this over just a little bit. Do the same thing on the bottom. See if I can straighten it just a hair. This one's got to go over a little bit. All right, let's close the door, pick it up a little bit, and get this pin in. All right, let's try it. Okay. Uh, sweet silence. All right. So I think your son will be able to sweep now. Thank you very much. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Sweet silence indeed. Yeah. Nice job. So how often do you see that? Is that common to have a hinge bent like that? Well, I mean, those are inexpensive hinges, so the metal is really soft. And mm. you could bend that if you drive the pin down too hard with your hammer, or if the hinge is apart and you drop it on the floor, that could bend it just a little bit too. Get what you pay for, right? Exactly. All right. Well, that's it from us. Keep your letters and your emails coming. We'd love to hear from you. So until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Tom Silver for Ask This Old House. Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project. So be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.